All right. Well, in the interest of time, I know we still will have folks joining as we go, but on behalf of the Association for the Study of Higher Education, better known as ASH, um, I'm pleased to welcome you today. My name is Alicia Castillo Shrestha. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Assistant Director for Conference and Events for the Association. Thank you so much for joining us for today's CIHE webinar, um, which is facilitated and um, put together by our wonderful um, Council for International um, Higher Education. We will be recording today's session, so it will be available on the ASH website for reference um, later on. If you need help during the session for anything um, technical or just general support, you can reach out to me via the chat um, or the Q&A, whichever one works best for you. And if you'd like to turn on closed captioning, you can do so at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I also want to acknowledge the land that I'm joining from. I am joining from the traditional and contemporary homelands of the Shawnee and Miami. And Ash is doing um, what we can to help folks reflect on space and place and also move beyond land acknowledgement. So I'll be putting some information about um, the work that our incredible volunteers and members are doing towards um, indigene indigeneity in our association. So I'll put that in the chat. But it's my pleasure to turn it over to Shinji, today's um, facilitator for the session. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you, Alicia. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh... Oh, so now you can see my slide, hopefully. Okay, awesome. Yeah, thank you again for joining us today. I'm so honored to host today's amazing presentation. Uh, but before going to the presentation, I just want to talk a little bit more about the ASH CIHE. So now you may see the now like name of the our executive committee members, Dr. Christina Yao, Dr. Katie Ku, Dr. Hannah Ho, actually two, one of today's presenters, and Brandon Smith. Uh, Dr. Hejin Tina Yale, uh, me, Skip, and uh, Dr. Mary Ann Bodin Al Sharif. And, uh, oh, sorry, that's an. Oh, okay. So we encourage you to further engage with ASH CIHE community by joining as a member of ASH. In the registration, you can indicate your interest in the Council of International Higher Education. And ASH CIG has a lot of like, you know, activities and benefits, such as ASH pre-conference registration discount, uh, bi-monthly newsletter, networking and social events, webinars, connection with international education researchers globally. And I particularly recommend those people who are new to the field to join NAS, because I was a former international student and when I started my PhD, actually, I didn't have any professional connection in this community because I did my master's degree in the different field. But then once I joined the CIHE, I found the people who share the research interest or like some background with me. And I felt, oh, I found my community. You know, this is where I can belong in ASH. So ASH CIHE is a great place to find people and de develop your network. So please join us. And of course, if you are senior scholars, of course, uh, also please join us. Okay, and uh, I also want to highlight, yes, the ASH proposal deadline is around the corner. I'm sorry if I'm reminding <laughs> you of that, you know, maybe some of you like me actually want to forget about it. But yes, the deadline is there. And, uh, as you may know, we, CIHE, also has a pre-conference of the ASH, a day before ASH conference, and where we have uh, presentations and uh, uh, other events. So this is also amazing opportunity to meet others. And moreover, if you attended last year's CIHE, you might also remember we have a, a social event a day before ASH CIHE where you can have a great food, snacks, and uh, the bubble teas. You know, it was last year's highlight. We have many different bubble teas. So if you want to have a good food, bubble teas, and meet amazing people, please join the ASH CIAG pre-conference social event as well. OK, so now uh, we want to move to the presentation part, the more exciting part. So yeah, today, 
uh, we have uh, three amazing scholars here. Uh, Dr. Chris Glass, uh, who is a professor of practice at the Boston College. Dr. Hen Tan is an associate professor at the National Institute of Education, Nyon Technology University, Singapore. And Dr. Hannah Ho is an assistant professor in higher education at Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. And today they will have a presentation about their best paper, uh, the, the paper which won the best paper award at the ASH CIHE 2023. Uh, intersections of identity and the status interna in international student perceptions of culturally engaging campus environment, which is published uh, in the International Journal of Intercultural Relations. So again, uh, I'm really uh, excited to have their presentation, like uh, who are, you know, my mentor, friends, and collaborators. So now, like uh, Chris, Tan, Hannah, the floor is yours. Oh, but sorry, one point. Uh, during the, uh, today's agenda is, uh, we have a presentation and after that we have a Q&A session. And if you have any questions, yes, you can also hold your question till the end of the presentation, but at the same time, you can just post your questions in the chat and or Q&A because I can track them uh, on my end. So after their presentation, I also can ask those questions chronologically. So yeah, if you find a que present uh, questions during the presentation, like you, yeah, just you can post it. Okay, yes, the floor is yours, people. Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to stop my share screen. Uh, yep. Thank you so much, Shinjin. Let me just share my screen. Okay. okay, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining this webinar. Uh, so me and our team, we will present our study. And Dr. Glass and Dr. Hung, do you want to do a brief introduction by yourself? Then I can do a brief introduction by mine, then we can just get started. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Glass. I'm a faculty member at uh, Boston College. I'm glad you could join us today. Hi, everyone. This is Tang joining you from Singapore, um, Nanyang Technological University National Institute of Education. Glad to see many familiar faces and new ones, too. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And my name is Hannah Ho. I'm a faculty member at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Again, thank you so much for being here and also thank you for the CIG for this award. And as you can see, uh, our article's title is Intersections of Identity and Status in International Students' Perceptions of Cultural like, Engaging Campus Environments. Okay, um, so a little bit background about our study. So scholars have argue that much of the higher education institutions, their relationship with international students, and particularly those institutions located in Western countries has a um, deficit of pathologization. And in this pathologization, it has attributed to the neocolonial mentality. So where the Western identities are considered dominant well, international students as inferior or intellectually unequal. And in this environment, international students are ordered as abroad or foreign, and also with their voices excluded. And there have been calls for higher ed institutions to share their new colonial mentalities and to take responsibility to create an equitable and inclusive environment. So by recognizing the international students' identities and their statuses, so they are shaped by their social groups and also the institutionalized the social structures they confront. So we seek to understand their perceptions of um, culturally engaging campus environments using an intersection lens. So that is the intersection of identity and your status. And our study 
highlights international students' perceptions of campus environments to create an equitable and inclusive environment. So our research question is, what are the significant differences of international students' perceptions of culturally engaging campus environments by intersections of identity and status? So a little information about culturally engaging campus environments. So it called a SOSI. So the SOSI model, it offers a um, holistic and quantifiable way to measure how a student perceives the college environment in terms of its cultural relevance and cultural responsiveness. So the cultural relevance it considers the degree to which students perceive their campus as relevant to their cultural backgrounds and identities. And cultural responsiveness is more about the extent to which students perceive their programs and practices as responsive to the, the needs of the culturally diverse student populations. So uh, that's for the research using the SOSI model like more primarily focus on the domestic students of color. So there is a need to extend the research uh, to include international students as they experience particular, like particularly uh, specific dynamics in the college environment. So for example, so while international students, they face the racism. So the, revealing there are some overlapping experiences with the domestic students of color, but international students are additionally uh, subject to new nationalism or discrimination against their nationalities, et cetera. Uh, so in addition to creating international student voices by understanding their perceptions of culturally engaging campus environments, so we seek to expand the SOSI research by investigating international student perceptions. We adopted Crenshaw's intersectionality framework to examine international students, their perceptions of culturally engaging campus environments. So intersectionality was um, originally used by Crenshaw to advance black feminist theory and activism. So in our study, we use intersectionality lens to foregrounded relationships between inequality and the power within different social settings and how individuals' identities and experiences are shaped by the different settings. And these intersections create a unique experience revealing the complexity and heterogeneity of different people's experiences. And intersectionality, it is, um, often used in a qualitative research, but in light of how an intersectionality framework can more accurate, accurately reflect the diversity of voices among international students and enhanced equity through improved understanding of them. So we use intersectionality to, we use this intersectionality lens to study international students' perceptions of cultural engaging campus environments along various intersections of their identities and statuses. So we used in a quantitative work with an intersectionality lens. So only when we understand the diversity of voices at the margins can we begin to address the imbalance of the power between institutions and international students. And I will pass next to Dr. Glass. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk about the methodology section. Uh, but to introduce that, I'm going to talk about how this study came into being in the first place. Um, and it really came into being when Tang and I were sitting outside in San Francisco at the Comparative International Education Society, kind of expressing our discontents with international student research, uh, questions that weren't being asked, and the need to explore things in different ways. Uh, Tang, uh, she can say more, had uh, a friend, uh, Sam Mesus, who's done 
done, uh, who has a great data set called the Culturally Engaging uh, Campus Environments. And I want to thank Sam because it's really his generosity that shared this data with us that made this possible. Because uh, the kind of research we're going to talk about today takes a lot of data, and data is really hard to come by. And so Sam's generosity really is what made this possible, especially um, this incredible instrument, the Culturally Engaging Campus Environments, but really this set of relationships. So Tang, Heather, uh, Hannah and I would meet uh, about this time um, every every week uh, to work on this uh, because we're in different uh, time zones, uh, but we would work together. But the motivations I think came for us related to our own research on international students, understanding that there are aspects of identity and status that weren't being considered. So first identity, um, and Ash has brought, uh, a number of scholars at Ash have brought attention to this, uh, the role that social class, first generation status, uh, ability, disability status plays into uh, the ways international students experience mobility was important for us to begin to explore. And then second status, uh, as my colleagues Rajika Mandari and Bernhard Streitweiser highlight, migration happens more than just out of instrumentality and voluntariness. Uh, migration happens more and more for reasons of uh, economic need, uh, and then also because of displacement due to refugee status, or perhaps uh, migration due to a family migrating to another country uh, and bringing a child child who ends up coming into the education system of that country uh, due to the family's migration. So these were questions we were like, international student research just doesn't, hasn't looked at this sufficiently. It's beginning to look in this space. Uh, and so we wanted to use uh, uh, the big data that uh, Sam provided us to look at this. And so I'm going to go over some of the technical aspects, uh, but we can certainly unpack more of this uh, in the question to answer. So we used a multivariate analysis in this, um, and it, it gave us the ability to look at multi dimensions of identity, race, uh, religion, uh, region, social class, and things like I've talked about. Uh, but what was great is Sam's data set doesn't just look at one dimension of the kind of environment. It looks at nine different factors of a culturally engaging campus environment. Um, I mentioned some of this in the report I did on a new uh, compact for international students with the American Council on Education uh, and ways in which we can think about uh, issues of cultural familiarity, cultural cross-cultural engagement, cultural validation, collectivist orientations. It comes from my own dissatisfaction with the conceptualization that belonging often means an international student's belonging to basically um, becoming, um, having to assimilate to a culture of a university and belonging can often uh, 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 end up being used that way versus belonging is really about that international student shaping that culture of the institution and having uh, a political role in shaping the, the campus culture. And so the nine dimensions that Sam talks about really captures both the relevance uh, of this belongingness and the ability for international students to shape that culture. Uh, next slide. Um, so we looked at the campus culture and campus uh, culture engaging campus environments. Uh, it had a large data set, uh, even larger than what we report here, because there's a lot of cleaning that needs to take place. Roughly about twenty thousand uh, students have completed it. Two thousand of which. Uh, were in our population uh, after cleaning and other kind of considerations to make sure that we uh, could have a proper representative sample. We had uh, about 1700 participants in our sample. Next. Um, our sample is uh, diverse along different dimensions, uh, and we we work to ensure that and this captures some of that um, some of the main dimensions next. Um, the five scales of the culturally engaging campus environments model uh, looks at cultural familiarity, uh, relevant knowledge, community service, engagement, and validation. Next. Um, it also looks at um, issues of cultural responsiveness. In other words, uh, the collectivist cultural orientation, whether or not the campus provides a humanized educational environment, proactive philosophies of holistic support. Now, all of these are listed. Uh, the scales that support these have been validated through Sam's research, uh, pre predominantly on um, uh, US students or uh, US citizens. Uh, so we use this as a way to explore a new population. He was really interested in that. Um, and uh, there's information related to um, our the reliability of our measures uh, and how those were constructed in the full paper. 
uh, our findings uh, look like a lot of numbers. And so let me put this into uh, into some kind of plain language just so you could uh, you can understand what we're talking about. Um, so region, visa status, social class and degree level credits completed in age all had significant effects. And we would expect that. Uh, but um, to our uh, to our surprise or somewhat not to our surprise with the intersectionality lens, uh, race, gender alone did not uh, first generation status and STEM major uh, in living situation and GPA did not have uh, effects. So next slide. Um, and that'll be next slide. But that is kind of why we did uh, this uh, approach in the first place. And so uh, one of the things we discovered is that old, older students uh, and those with more credits had lower cross-cultural engagement and cultural community service. Um, uh, more credits were also related to oh, social class had a significant uh, differences across most of the SESI factors. And so our, our hypothesis related to social class uh, was validated, uh, especially cultural familiarity, validation, collectivist orientations, humanized environments, holistic support and proactive philosophy. So this was the most of all the factors uh, that we examined. It. This really underscores, I think, the importance of social class, not just socioeconomic lines, but how it shapes cultural identities and needs of students, recognizing the international students don't just come from different countries, they come from different uh, 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 um, economic and social strata um, within those countries as well, and it does affect their experience. Next slide. We also found a number of significant uh, two-way interactions, uh, two-way interactions as well, such as the combination between the living situation and gender, living situation and region, degree and race level, degree level, and STEM major status as well. Now, the living situation interaction suggests that where students live, whether they live on or off campus, uh, had implications as well as uh, how uh, these experiences differed by gender and region as well. These indicates the ways that uh, students live shapes their cultural experiences, and they can be differed upon, upon on, uh, based on both gendered and regional dimensions. Next slide. Um, let's go next slide. And then finally, oh, no, but go back one. Uh, sorry. And finally, I would say that it's important that institutions evaluate residential life policies in light of this through uh, a SESI lens, asking questions about house, housing configurations, uh, better build cultural familiarity, and other aspects of the student populations. So I'm going to turn it over to Tang, but I just would summarize that the findings really demonstrate the value of a theoretically grounded, multi dimensional instrument like SESI and in looking to move beyond demographics so that we can better understand the complex ways that identity and status impact international students. Now, this is not without its limitations and certainly its complexities. And we can definitely talk about the realities of this kind of research, what we think we ought, we brought to the table, but also what, um, what might need to be uh, further explored by other researchers. So, Tang. Hmm, I don't know. I think Hannah is supposed to be talking about these oh, based oh, on Hannah, our agreement, Hannah. yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, I will share a little bit about um, the discussions about our study. Uh, so as we mentioned earlier, so to the best of our knowledge, the study is the first to utilize the methodological hybridization by adopting intersectionality framework, which is often used in core research. Um, so the findings indicate that international students' identities and statuses intersect on different levels to use the multifaceted identities that shape their perceptions of the campus environment. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, um, so international students, their socioeconomic status and legal status shift their perceptions of uh, cultural engaging environments. So as Dr. Glass mentioned earlier, so our findings reveal that a wealth where their socioeconomic status affects their perceptions of cultural relevance and responsiveness. So specifically the upper class international students, they perceived higher cultural relevance compared to lower and middle class students. So they found it easier to locate and connect with the people from similar backgrounds. And also the upper class international students, they also per perceive, perceive the higher cultural responsiveness. 
And our findings also show that degree level and region intersect to shift international perceptions of cultural responsiveness, particularly in terms of collectivist cultural orientation and proactive philosophies. So undergraduate students from Asia and Africa, they felt their campus environments less likely to support each other compared with the students from Europe and North America. And undergraduate students from Asia, Africa, and Latin America, they felt the faculty and the staff less likely to provide them access to information, opportunities, and the support than the students from Europe and North America. Um, so for the impl uh, implications, so by first recognizing the needs of international students and understanding um, to what extent that your campus are culturally engaging. So institutions can descend a new colonial pedestal like the on which they perch, and also the system model can be used in different ways. So in measuring their campus environments, using the system model, institutions can establish the equitable and supportive cultural environments for international students to enhance their belonging and academic and psychosocial um, outcomes. And the faculty and staff can also use the social model to access the extent to which they provide information, resources, and the support for their students' success. And our study also calls for great nuances in how institutions respond to students' manifest needs. And next, I will pass to Dr. Hun. So I'm coming in to talk a little bit more about um, this piece on intersectionality. So uh, Chris, Hannah, and I thought that rather than just talk about the findings of the research and how we went about doing it, we thought it might be a bit interesting to actually take a little step back and reflect a little bit on our experiences with, you know, working with the intersectionality framework. So in terms of um, working with the international, uh, intersectionality framework, there are certain um, affordances as well as certain challenges as well. As um, um, Hannah had mentioned earlier, intersectionality framework typically tends to be used within qualitative frameworks. So we thought, okay, what would happen if we actually applied it to a, um, a quantitative data and, and look at it through a more quantitative lenses? What, what can we, what kind of affordances would it give? So um, the first one, as you can see, it's pretty evident from the findings, is that of that it exposes inter and um, intra-categorical differences. So much has been said around inter-categorical lines around, for example, nationality, but I think that that's less that's been said around intra-categorical lines. And for example, in this case, we found that students who live on or off campus have very different perspectives about culturally engaging campus environments. And that students who did not identify as male or female and who lived off campus actually felt less valued by the institution and connected less easily with institutional agents. We also found that you know, Asian students who lived on campus were less likely to believe people supported one another and helped each other towards success. Whereas the opposite was true for Latino, Latina, Latinx, and multiracial students. So really, you know, we can go into these rich, um, rich intersections, you know, of where you see, you know, gender with, with nationality, with living on campus, off campus, and so on and so forth. And I think that's, that's what makes this um, framework really powerful. So it reveals this um, heterogeneous experiences of international students. Because we often talk about international students as if they were homogenous, that there's this single one group of international students and, and that it means one thing, international, which means they're not from the US, not from the UK, not from Australia, or from Singapore and so on and so forth. Oftentimes, if we do go one step further, we'll say, okay, international students may represent, okay, particular nations, but rarely do we really break down within one nation. And I think in this case, it really, the intersectionality lens really affords us this opportunity to go into this, these nitty gritty details. 
so that it illuminates these seldom told perspectives of marginalized subpopulations. So, for example, we hear perspectives from marginalized subpopulations like students who choose not to identify with binary genders, or Asian students who lived on campus versus Latino and multiracial students who live on campus, with each group having very different views on how much they felt they were supported. So, in this research, we're unable to explain the reasons behind these patterns that we see. And we hope that you know, these findings can offer insight into where qualitative research can mix, um, um, follow up on. So next slide, please, Ahana. Thank you. In terms of other affordances, so as researchers and practitioners, I think these findings really also urges us to con contemplate how to better support groups facing multiple discriminations and challenges, and not just how to support them, but how to support them through our research. So how it, it really you know, encourages us to think you know, in terms of research, how can we look at what we look at in this field in many different areas, in different ways. And it urges us to question why some international students may have more positive experiences or perspectives than others and sensitizes us to various um, predicaments. So we hope that this, you know, using the international uh, intersectionality lens, it, it can actually invite us to question our own positionalities as well in the choices of students and topics around international students that we work with. Next slide, please, Hannah. Now on to the challenges. So it wasn't always that easy. It wasn't always that easy. And as, um, as Chris mentioned earlier, there's this thing about data sets and getting access to data sets. So we were really fortunate to be able to access this large data set and much thanks to Sam Museums at um, San Diego University for trusting us in using this data. It was actually really quite um, serendipitous. I, I wrote Sam about his research on SESI. I had, I had known Sam on other occasions working with him um, with, in AERA. So I wrote Sam and I said, Sam, you know, SESI is really interesting. And I'm wondering whether you have written um, research around international students using the SESI data. I can see there's so much power and connections to you know the international students' experience. And Sam was like, nope, too much data. You know, we don't have time to actually work on it. But if you're interested, please feel free to. And I was like, wow, someone is actually offering the data set to me to access. But the thing is that I'm not a quantitative researcher, right? Yet, you know, being a qualitative researcher, I feel like this was so powerful. And that's how, you know. Uh, Chris was talking about our little conversation, you know, in San Francisco. And I remember, oh, yeah, I was talking to Chris about this and Chris does work on, that's quantitative work. So when I reach out to Chris and ask him if he's interested in working on this, and happily so he was, and so did, and so was Hannah. So um, Chris invited Hannah to join this project. And so we had this access to this large data set. And yet, even though we had access to this fairly large data set, so as, um, uh, Chris mentioned, right, uh, there were more than 2,000 entries and after cleaning up, we had 1,700. Yet with this large enough data set, once we start breaking it up into all the various subcategories, we found that we actually weren't able to analyze or run analysis along certain lines that we wanted to because the numbers became too small. So for example, there are areas that we were really interested in. Um, Chris was really interested in legal statuses, you know, and then we talked about areas such as religion, fields of studies, um, disability or abilities, you know, and yet we found that, you know, we couldn't run analysis along these areas because the data was just too small once we disaggregated the data. So here we have a data set which is into the thousands and yet once we want to, when we want to work through it with the intersectionality lens and break it up into more pieces, it's, it's actually challenging. Um, we also recognize that not everyone will have um, the affordance to actually access a large data set. And it's actually extremely time consuming and extremely costly to actually um, collect the data for that. And then the second point that we um, experienced was really this, you know, as Ludwig actually uh, mentioned, this endlessness of differences. It's like, when we looked at the data, we were confronted by it and we're like, my goodness, you know, there's so many possibilities we can we can go down, you know, with this notion of intersectionality. So how should we, what should we foreground and what should we back, back, background, you know, in, in terms of our analysis. So Chris and Hannah 
um, being the quantitative researchers that they are, were actually facing a very complex statistical model that got ever more complex the more we wanted to break it down. And at the same time, um, we were faced with trying to coherently convey the results of our findings within a manuscript's word limit, right? So there were all these things that we felt like we were actually juggling at the same time in order to write this article. So even though you see it as the best, um, best article, please bear in mind that it actually comes with a lot of challenges, even though it may seem like it's easy, easy, open and close inverted comma to get this best article, but actually behind it, there was a lot of angst and agony and many, many late night meetings for me and early morning meetings for um, Hannah and, and Chris. And finally, there was this thing about um, p-hacking as well, you know, at some point, we had to ask ourselves too, you know, and we had to be really cautious about p-hacking, you know, how do we avoid only reporting results that were statistically significant, you know, in our findings with this quantitative work? Hannah, next slide, please. Thank you. So as, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, given that this was a quantitative study, we actually found it difficult to explain some of the results. Um, some of them we could try to explain through existing literature. So for example, the, the point about um, upper class students from various uh, social economic group, right? Um, those from a higher socioeconomic group, upper class, you know, um, feeling a higher cultural relevance, relevance, you know, in their lives, they were able to more easily find folks that they could relate with, you know, things like that. We were able to actually try to explain with existing literature. And yet there were many other aspects that we weren't able to explain. So for example, why was there a difference in experiences for students who are Asian who live on campus versus Latina students who are on versus off campus? Why were there a difference in experiences for students um, who had different gender identification if they live on and off campus? So there are lots of all these little bits of nuances that were unexplained by quantitative research. But we really hope that this means that, you know, it gives qualitative researchers out there, you know, some fodder to think, you know, in terms of what they might want to pursue in future. So what next for implications? Um, that was another question we asked, you know, um, given finite resources, how much or how fair is it to divert resources to supporting smaller numbers, even as a researcher, you know, ourselves, you know, but, uh, beyond being a policymaker or a practitioner, when we think about using resources, even as researchers, you know, do we, do we go down to actually researching a small group of students versus a larger group of students? So there are all these questions around, um, fairness and, uh, and use of resources that we thought, you know, it would be interesting to think about as well, you know, in terms of using the intersectionality framework. So these are some reflections that we have. Um, we're happy to discuss further, you know, in the Q&A later on. And this, has, this brings us to the end of our sharing today. And thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you so much, Chris and Hannah. That was amazing presentation. Um, as a critical quant researcher, I really appreciate the value of this paper, right? Recognizing that like, those intersectionalities of, of international students that have been often overlooked in the traditional quant methods or quant papers. So this is like, you know, um, tell us, the, the paper tell us like, yeah, how we can approach to understand more like a complexity, more like a nuance, like, you know, that exists within international students. So I really like, you know, love your presentation and paper. So I really appreciate it. So now uh, I want to move to Q&A session. So again, if you have any questions, audience, uh, you can put in the Q&A or uh, chat and I'm going to track them and ask uh, presenters chronologically. So now I see the one question in the Q&A and actually, yeah, uh, Chris, yeah, gave us some answer, but uh, the question is, thank you for, thank you so much for the, this presentation. It's fantastic to see such a quantitative study of study perception, uh, student perceptions. I wonder what recommendations you have for qualitative researchers interested in measuring international student perceptions of academic inclusion in the classroom using semi-structured interviewing. Yeah, I'll, um, I, I answered in the chat, but I'm going to turn it, I, I was a quant person in our study, so I'm going to turn it to our qual experts, but I want, I do want to put a plug into, I would, I would say even as a quant person, um, 
Joining a community like the community on research with international students is something I would highly recommend. And I put a link to some resources and I would, I think my, my, my first response uh, would be, I would explore methods beyond simply semi-structured interviews and to look at some of the uh, methodological resources that are available on the site to think about um, the ways in which we can do um, critical uh, qualitative work. I think there's really highlighted and pointed because I'll I'll say, as Tang highlighted, the quantitative perspective, as complex as it allowed us to explore these things, doesn't get to the level of complexity that you can explore in qualitative research. Um, both Tang and, and Hannah, I know, are um, qualitative researchers, and so they might have thoughts as well. So I'm going to jump in quickly. Actually, I have the... I know I'm a qualitative researcher, qualitative, whatever that means to some extent. I do wonder, because I'm looking at the question it says to measure international students' perceptions of academic inclusion. In qualitative work, generally, sometimes we don't really talk about measuring perception. Measuring perceptions is more, it's, it's more, when we use the word measuring, it does sound like, you know, there is actually a fixed number out there and we're trying to measure or get at. So, so I don't know, if you're really interested in measuring perception, why not combine and do a mixed method of measuring that perception through a scale together with interviewing at the same time? Mm, I think that actually might lend you or afford you with more nuances in your data. Because frankly speaking, being a qualitative researcher, I mean, I do enjoy qualitative work a lot, but I also do see the limits of qualitative work. I'm always very open to thinking of, along quantitative lines as well. And since you already used the word measuring perception there, that actually has me thinking, hmm, to what extent might you be also predisposed to the notion of measuring perceptions as well through a quantitative lens? So I don't know any whether you are interested in doing both a, a mixed method, you know. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Maybe we can have a conversation, Any and, you know, you can... Uh, Shinji, are they able to actually unmute themselves to, to chat or is this only a one-directional Q&A? I believe this is one direction, uh, right? Oh, right, there, okay. Uh, yes, that's correct. Yeah. Oh, right. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, but they Hannah, would you have put, something like, to some weigh chat. in? Yeah. Yeah, yeah maybe you can, you know, Annie can, you know, write something into the chat or something. Yeah. I don't know, Hannah, do you have anything you want to weigh in on? Mm. Yes, I, yeah, I, actually, I have the same thoughts because, yeah, like marrying the perceptions to... It's like a matter, like the, the per se, the word, I feel it's like more about the quantitative word is like to, to marry the different kinds of levels. So I feel, yeah, and I also want to have a deeper understanding on the perceptions. I will say, um, with mixed mass, I think that will be better because like, for example, especially on a, like some levels, like a social economic status and, Speaking of the, the status, it's uh, like everyone, they have a different understanding of the level of a certain economic status. So I think if in, for example, like this way, it will be better, like for, for example, like putting a survey or something, have a certain standards with a measure of this certain amount of status so that everyone can like have this, the same understanding on that. Otherwise, if it's a, only ask okay what do you think like to under like what, what, what's your understanding of your certain amount of status that will be that will be really hard because everyone comes from the different backgrounds different cultures their understanding will be very different so yeah I go with both of you shared I think like Miss methods will be a better approach to deep understanding this I like, I suppose, if you really are wedded to a, just a, uh, a qualitative approach, then maybe you would say, uh, how might one understand academic inclusion or how, or exploring academic inclusions and so, yeah, rather than measuring, yeah. 
Thank you all. I, I, I got a request to unmute. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, I really do appreciate the feedback. Um, I am in the dissertation proposal phase, um, working through some of these questions for myself and my own research design. So it's wonderful to hear um, the different perspectives. Um, and I really do uh, really gravitate towards that mixed method approach that you're uh, vocalizing. So thank you for that. Our pleasure. Great question. I see a question in the chat um, yeah, from, uh, um, let's see, Hannah, yeah. around um, culturally responsive and culturally relevant pedagogy. Frank, I, I mean, well, I'm just going to weigh in on my perspective for that, and then maybe Hannah and Chris can weigh on that. I mean, to me, I actually see um, the aims for both as being fairly similar. You know, it's about supporting students, you know, for, for achievement, a certain social consciousness, you know, a respect for um, the cultures and cultures not being just ethnic cultures, but cultures being, you know, their ways of being, their identity, the values that they hold and so on and so forth. So I think really sometimes when we talk about, you know, whether it's responsive versus relevant, oftentimes I think that it's actually um, a crude to who's doing the writing. I think culturally responsive pedagogy is more associated with um, Dr. Geneva Gay and maybe culturally relevant pedagogy is more associated to um, Dr. Gloria Lesson billing. But yet for both of them, I think they both have sort of the same aims and purposes. So I'm somebody who will not actually, or who, who usually don't sweat too much over the nomenclature, because I think that the spirit behind it is more important than, than the labels. Um, I'm not sure that that's how I read um, the difference between these two. I'm not sure whether Chris or, or Hannah would want to um, weigh in on this. Yeah, uh, that's a great question, actually, like for the social model. So cultural relevance is more about like how students perceive their campus because relevance, like more relevant to their cultural backgrounds and identities, for mm -hmm. example, um, because the cultural relevance that has like a five construct, like a, a cultural familiarity is the, like how easy it's to find people with a similar background as you. And uh, are there any, are there enough opportunities for other people to learn about the culture of your own communities? Is it more about the relevance to, to the cultural backgrounds and identities? And responsiveness is more about like, uh, how students perceive the programs, practices of institutions and also communities like, as responsive to their needs of the, the diverse cultural populations. If I could add something here, I mean, because I think part of the interest of these sessions is to ask important research and conceptual questions. Um, and the other the other thing I'd bring to this conversation is um, the unit of analysis we're talking about uh, or the level of analysis, because I think, um, you know, pedagogy is one kind of a level of analysis and the SESI instrument is uh, designed to explore environments. I mean, there's a long history in research on uh, on students in higher education that looks at the kind of campus climate or the campus environment uh, and how that is conceptualized and defined. And so, but all of that can't be simply, you can't always easily take something that is meant to take something that is kind of complex in this kind of ecosystem, this higher level of environment, and always bring it down to the lower level of maybe a classroom environment. There, there's times it, it it applies and there's times it doesn't, but I would just kind of highlight that uh, it is it shows the the needs for um, these uh, theoretical frameworks and conceptual frameworks and, and qualitative and quantitative research, uh, but also the ways in which we begin to understand in which um, at the levels in which we explore these um, or we apply these as well, um, because um, they don't always fit for purpose. Like, I, I think what I would argue and, and my colleagues might disagree is, you know, SESI uh, works great at this. Uh, it's really meant to be an instrument for change. That's why I like the way uh, I think to um, Annie's uh, idea of policy environment. I encourage you to check out SESI because thinking about the use of your mixed me method study is just mm -hmm. as important as the design and the results as well. And I think what Sam has done exceptionally is if you look at his website, it's really meant to be an instrument that fosters conversation about the use of that data by the people and stakeholders that are affected by that data. 
Um, and that could include uh, certainly campus stakeholders and leaders, but also international students who are directly affected by these questions. And so I just wanted to highlight um, kind of, I think that dimension of our research as well, because it's both a strength and a limitation in terms of the, um, the, um, the kind of ecosystem, uh, you know, kind of a Bronfenbrenner kind of the idea of the ecosystem of higher ed and when you're looking at one level analysis and how it maps onto others as well. Sorry, can I just jump in to say that I completely misread the question because of what pedagogy threw me off. So when I read it as culturally relevant pedagogy or cultural responsive pedagogy, I was thinking of Geneva gave us as lesson billings work. When I realized that after Hanna was explaining, then I realized that maybe the question that um, Hannah Kim was asking was actually around the instrument around cultural relevant measures of cultural relevance versus measures of um, cultural responsiveness. So I'm sorry, I didn't pick up. So I, 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 I misunderstood the question. Yeah. Yeah. Um... We still have time, so the audience now, like, if you have, uh, like, you know, uh, further questions, or, like, any new questions, you can post in, like, you know, chat, uh, Q&A, and uh, thank you, uh, Alicia, she kind of changed the setting, so now, like, if they want to chime in, like, you know, verbally, they also can do that uh, by raising hands. I'm not 100% sure about the Zoom setting, but... Oh, and, um... Okay, meanwhile, maybe I'm going to use my privilege, uh, you know, of being a host. Because, again, like, I have tons of questions, actually, you know, about the paper. But I particularly want to ask about the point, like, end lesson of differences, right? Like, that you mentioned. Yeah, like, it's quite... Because, realistically, like, when we want to explore the intersectionality, like, differences. But, like, as you say, like, you know, if we really try to go, like, in a different intersectionality, like, you know, we can make a tons of, like, millions of, like, different intersectionalities, right? Like, uh, gender, race, regional, first language, disability, and then, like, uh, so, and then now, like, uh, considering that we might work with practitioners, Right, like international student office or student affair professionals, like who help international students on a daily basis. Like, I'm wondering, like, uh, yeah, I know, like, this is like, you know, as a point you already brought up. Like, I want to hear a little bit more about, like, you know, how we can use, uh, like, you know, those differences, like, you know, kind of in the, uh, the way that we can work with those student affairs stuff. Like, in which level, like, you know, might be the best one. I know this is a little bit. Tricky question, but at the same well, time, really we love question. tricky questions. Our tricky yeah. questions are good. Gigi. I, I'll give a quantitative response to this a little bit, uh, in a little bit of a philosophical one. So there is statistical significance, and then there's significant. And what I would say is one person's experience is significant. And so it's it's even even though like uh, with the multivariate analysis, what I'd say is once you have a, a, a group, a kind of a two by two group where you have a small group over here, maybe 10 people and a small group over here, 10 people, we might have one person that has, you know, check that box and check that box as well. Uh, well, people a are more than boxes, and that's a limitation of this kind of research. But second is that one person is still significant. So although it doesn't make the paper if you're doing research to change at your institution, collecting data and looking at data on that still matters. So I always want to make the conceptual point that statistical significance and significance just broadly is really important to understand. But but second, I think uh, I, I think I and I think you would agree with this, Shinji. I think this kind of research gives visibility to these questions because it's it, uh, rather than leaving these identities unexplored or unanalyzed it by collecting the data it's a form of power because you're naming you're naming an experience that you think is important to analyze and so i think from a critical quantitative research perspective um the 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 power in naming these reality these categories that have been socially constructed that we then use to make policy decisions around certain categories um, and people who, I mean, we all understand the politics of data and certainly uh, people who uh, who understand that uh, want to regulate what kinds of data we use and, and collect and don't collect in higher education. So I would uh, I would just highlight um, the importance I think this shows of, of uh, just the kinds of data that we collect as well. Um, yeah, there's more to say, but um, that would be my initial thought. I'm going to jump in briefly with uh, 
a practitioner response, I guess. Um, I think what I'm going to say is going to actually go against the grain of what we, we found too, in a sense that actually in finding, you know, through the intersectionality lens, we might have found students who are at the fringe, who are marginalized in these ways for international students. For example, you know, their gender identification and whether they live on and off campus. But it doesn't mean that we need to just only target this group. Instead, what we can do is to also see the intersectionality of this group of students' experience with that of domestic students. Who is to say that, you know, domestic students might not have these same perspectives as well? Perhaps they do have these perspectives. So in terms of the policy, you know, um, responses or uh, working with the staff, international students or office staff, perhaps one thing to do is to not break down into working only with international office versus non-international office, but to think in terms of provision, how can we provide for both international and local students or domestic students simultaneously, but making a very small tweak in terms of the provision. So it could be that, for example, for, um, for international students, it could be that maybe they found that they have a much stronger um, compatriots, you know, network with, you know, students from their, from their countries. So we could also provide, um, I don't know, you know, flyers and um, information, counseling information and resources and so on around LGBTQ or around mental health resources and so on. But those same resources will be from the same office, but one could be actually filtered out to international students by giving it to their compatriots or their peers to actually disseminate and the other one could be through another means. So I think it takes a certain level of creativity to see that overlap as well rather than thinking in terms of just single solid lines in terms of um, provisions of um, support. Yeah. Yeah, based on uh, Tan, Chris shared, I just want to add one thing. Um, so for practitioners like student affairs office, I feel it's it's really important to have the collaboration between different offices because the like the studies intersectionality is really intersections of, of like different factors is really cannot be separated. Like the time I mentioned, the living living situation, gender, and also like a different uh like Asian students, like like the multiracial students, like how can this like a different office, how how can they work with one another and to support like different types of students? I feel this is really important. Yeah, thank you so much. And I realize it's almost time. So thank you again, Doctors uh, Glass Hang Ho. Uh, I really appreciate your time and you know this paper was really valuable to our field. So I really, really appreciate it, you know, your time and this paper. So yeah, uh, also I look forward to seeing you everyone, you know, including today's presenters and audience at the Ash 2024 in Minneapolis. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny, for hosting. <laughs> Yes, and thank you so much for having us and giving us this award. We appreciate it. Yeah, look forward to seeing everybody at ASH this year. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.